like to say something special about Lake because if we all here together today, it started back in the spring. Um, as we mentioned in the opening act, if I may say that earlier this morning and yesterday, you know, when COVID hit, we, we were trying to, we had this platform that had, you know, two years under its belt. And obviously all the eyes, you know, turn in the industry into the portrait because we seem to be the perfect solution in the current situation. But we thought, what else could we do, you know? And, and Lake is the king of podcast. And, and I called Lake and I said, Lake, what could we do? You know, we have this idea of doing a day of webinar, or, you know, and we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's how ePortrait Live Tech Webinars started. And, and Lake, um, you know, when we all have gray hair, I, I started to get quite a few <laughs> house and tell your grandkids, you know, your dad, your grandpa is at the origin of all of that. So e portrait Life Tech webinar started with Lake and with John Cozzi. Um, we thought, my God, if we get 20 people on, we'll be happy. And then it was like a hit instantly. And, uh, and then that series became like a weekly show and, and the shows and the series was so great because it was just a way of, you know, people talking to each other, connecting, engaging, chatting. And that's exactly what the industry has been missing this year. And so the things took on and on and on. And then we said, well, you know what? Let's do a full week of those. <laughs> and, uh, but that started back with Link. So, uh, so Lake, you, uh, you, you know, one, one in a kind in this industry. Um, and too kind, too kind. I wanted to thank you for that. We're big fans of, of, of Keith and, and Matt and everyone at Total Seal. We had some wonderful drag racer this morning. And, uh, and you know, I've always admired Matt, uh, who, you know, combined both the racer, and, and, and the entrepreneur and, you know, running the whole business and competing every weekend. And, and I'm so grateful that now that you have financial institution, part of the uh, uh, total seal organization, they basically let you be who you are and they let you raise that. I mean, this is, this is the secret. I mean, Wilfred Albach was talking about that earlier. So without any more, uh, um, you know, introduction, it is nine o'clock here in California. I see Ed on, but I don't see his camera. So um, we are going to see if we can get Ed's camera on. Here it is. There it is. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. Good. I, I thought you would be in front of a machine. I'm surprised. No, unfortunately, I'm at home at the moment. <laughs> very good, very good. But so this session is going to be unique in the sense that every session we have had a host. We have had Jeff, Jeff Hanna, Joe Castillo, uh, Brad Gilly, John Kiroy, Paul Fanner. But on this one, Lake is such a pro. He runs those sessions all the time. So Lake is going to be both your host and your presenter. So Lake, you're in charge. We'll see you in 50 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Francis. I appreciate the very kind words. It was very easy for me to say, hey, you guys should be doing this. It's completely different for you guys to actually go and put it all together and, and make it happen. So that's that's pretty cool that we had the opportunity to do that. Okay, so uh, appreciate everybody tuning in to watch this morning. I, right now, am in beautiful Mentor, Ohio, in the conference room at Wisco Pistons. Yep, it is beautiful Cleveland, Ohio tourism weather today. So can't thank... Um, Bob Brigging and Scott Hyland and Vic and uh, all the guys here at J.E. Trey McFarland uh, for letting us come in and, and, and do the webinar today from here. Uh, Keith is in lovely, warm Arizona. And Ed, I think you're at home, right? I am in uh, Cedar Hill, Missouri. All right. Probably a lot better than here. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so it's funny. Yeah, it's how the, the topic of today's uh, presentation, as Francis said, is ring seal soup. And I, I like to use that analogy because in, in my perspective and experience has been that you know, piston ring seal, right? Getting this piston ring to seal against that piston 
and against the cylinder wall isn't like cooking a steak where it's a single item and it's all about what you do to that one thing. Ring seal is a combination, just like yeah, Italian wedding soup isn't just the meatballs or the spices or the broth or the vegetables. It's all of them combining together that creates the soup. And that's what ring seal is all about. It's not just about the piston. It's not just about the cylinder wall. It's not just about the piston ring itself. It's also the oil. And they all have to come together. And that key interface of how they work together really is surface finish, which is why we wanted to get our good friend Ed Keebler from Rottler on here, because achieving the proper surface finish is a whole lot, I don't want to say harder than it looks, but maybe the best way to say is your eyes can be deceiving. Uh, I know just in my travels this year, running around the country with my handy dandy Meditelio profilometer, that um, you can see a cylinder and you can see the cross hatch and it can look good to the naked eye. But then when you scan it with said device, you'll find out that that surface finish isn't quite what you think it might be. So um, Keith, why don't you kind of fill everybody in on what we're looking for and why surface finish matters so much, why it's maybe the key ingredient uh, to this ring seal suit? Well, the thing that we battle so much is good oil retention. As you said, like, you know, oil, and you've said this before, we didn't say it today, but oil is the gasket. It is the sealing device. It is what the rings ride on. It's what the piston rides on. Uh, I've, I've seen so many rings come in that have been, you know, scuffed up, torn up, uh, welding problems, piston skirt problems, all these things that are perceived as you know, a part problem, but it's really a cylinder finish problem. They simply have taken it to their shop. The gentleman at the shop's done what he thought was a good job of honing. But at the end of the day, when we start looking at those numbers, we're looking at that amount of oil retention on that cylinder bore. It just isn't enough for the type of application they're working on. It, it may be a, a, a very heavily fueled engine, blown alcohol engine, alcohol, you know, sprint car engine, something that's pouring a lot of fuel in, it needs a lot of oil retention. Uh, it could be a, a softer block that's going to wear a little faster. So getting that surface finish, you know, correct for your application is such a critical thing. And as Lake indicated, it, it, you can't see it with your eyes, folks. We're talking micro inches here. Uh, I know Lake just was at a gentleman's shop recently, looked at it, beautiful looking finish, uh, had that great, nice, shiny, bright, silvery look. The cylinder should never be dark or dull or gray, shouldn't be black. It should always look like that fresh cut aluminum really brilliant and sparkly. But even though he had achieved that, that base, you know, cut that depth that it needed to, which I'm sure we're going to expand on here quite a bit, that valley wasn't there. So we're getting into premature ring failure, premature cylinder failure, premature piston failure, simply because it's not holding enough oil. Oh, you said, Keith, that's, that's spot on, is that it's not holding enough oil, because I think that's one thing that we kind of forget about when we think about ring seal and cylinder finish is that at the end of the day, this piston ring, while it is a seal, it's also a lubricated part. And proper lubrication is having the right oil, which is the right viscosity and the additives for the application, but also having it in the right place at the right time and the right amount. So not only is that oil being the gasket between the piston ring and the cylinder wall and the ring lands, that oil also is protecting and lubricating that part. And if there's not enough valley, like you said, on the cylinder wall to retain the oil, not only can it not function properly as the gasket, but now all those components can't be lubricated properly. And as we all know, when you don't have proper lubrication in an engine, bad things happen very quickly. So with that being said, Ed, why don't you give us a little bit of idea about how we should go about, what's the process, the, the mindset in achieving those, that proper surface finish? Because 
I, you know, there's a lot of different shops, a lot of different equipment, and there's different abrasives, and there's a whole lot we're going to cover in this hour in terms of how we achieve that finish. So kind of give us that intro into the proper mindset of achieving that finish. Sure. And, and thanks, Lake. Um, good to see you and Keith both. Um, as I always say, every time I'm on one of these deals with you two, I learn something new. So um, it's always good to be on with both of you. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to cylinder wall finish, you know, it, I, I always say this, and, and, and I truly believe this, is, is we're not experts at cylinder rings at Rottler Manufacturing. We let Lake and Keith determine what finishes that their rings really need or, or they desire. And then we'll give them, we're smart enough to know what to do to give them that proper finish. And so typically in today's world, what we're looking at is, is what we call a plateau finish. And, and, and Keith, I know can elaborate on that and so can Lake, but, but what we're really trying to do is, is we're going in with a rougher uh, diamond abrasive to create these deep valleys as Lake and Keith talk about. And then we're gonna go over the top of that. And in our particular instance, we recommend a, a 600 grit CBN abrasive. That's a very clean cutting abrasive leaves no torn and fragmented metal, really cleans the cylinders up well going over the top of the diamonds. And so we'll put a, depending on what RVK or PK we want, that depends on the amount of strokes we use for the CBN. But, but that's kind of the typical, it's a two-step process, Lake. In today's world, I really don't think you can get away with one step any longer with, with the, the, the changes in ring materials and oils and things like that. You know, both of you guys kind of alluded to that a little bit about, you know, you've got to have the right valleys. And the, the guy before you, you know, he went to his shop and the guy put a, a surface finish on there that he thought was correct. And it probably was 10 or 15 years ago, you know, before rings got much thinner and we changed from, from molly rings to tool steel rings and we changed the viscosity of the oils and the hardnesses of the blocks and all of these sort of things. So as, as you guys always allude to, you know, it's a soup and it's not one ingredient. Yeah, you're, you're spot on, Ed. I think that's one thing you just touched on. And uh, Keith, you and I were talking about this last night, that the difference between the old school type of rings and today's steel rings. Why don't you expand on that a little bit, Keith, and let everybody understand why there's this difference between the materials and how that's affecting the soup. Well, absolutely. When, when we talk about, you know, the material of the ring, you always hear the word uh, ductile molly or, you know, ductile chrome or iron. And I always like to throw this out. How many of you out there have used a chrome molly ring? Uh, actually, no, you haven't. Because <laughs> it can either be chrome or molly. We're not making it out of tubing. When you hear that, we're talking about the coating on the face edge of the ring. On that leading edge of the surface, that running leading edge, that's what we're talking about. And, and what's changed dramatically is, is molybdenum has been around, obviously, it's, it's, we'll say it's in the periodic table, so it's been around forever. But in, in the piston ring world, molybdenum has been popular since the 60s and kind of moved its way forward. One of the nice things about it is it has very good porosity. It's up to about 40% porosity. So it gives you a surface that will absorb oil. The point of the cylinder wall and point of honing, besides trying to get you know a straight round board, good board geometry, is getting that surface finish to hold oil. Well, you had a backup plan, the molybdenum. The molly kind of holds oil well too. So if you miss the board finish a little bit, well, you got kind of a backup here because of the molly. Problem with molly, molly doesn't stick very well. So if we get into a little bit of detonation, we get into a high boost situation, little knock in the engine, there goes the molly. And Molly's pretty sharp, pretty nasty stuff. Gets in the skirt of the piston, tears things up, destroys the cylinder wall. Cylinder seal goes out the window like crazy. And another issue is it really doesn't adhere well on the thin rings that we use today. You use 564 rings, 332nd rings, big fat tractor rings. You know, hey, it's not too bad. Adhesion's pretty reasonable. But try put Molly on a 0.7 millimeter ring or a 0.5 millimeter ring. There's just no surface. It's not going to stay stuck to the ring. So molybdenum had its day and it has its place. 
in today's racing world and in today's performance rank, even at the OE levels, because there ain't, but face it, folks, there's production cars out there today that run 0.8 millimeter rings. I can point out some GM products that are 0 0.8, 0 0.82 millimeter. That five, six years ago was the, oh my gosh, thin rings that was a NASCAR package. Today, it's in a production engine. Is that a molly coated ring? No, it is a PVD hard coated ring. We're looking at coatings like you have tungsten carbide carbon, chrome nitride, titanium nitride, hard coatings. They wear very well, they last a long time, but at the same time, they now demand all the oil retention be done by the cylinder wall. It's not a 50, 50, 60, 40 you know, deal now, it's about a 90, 10. It needs all the oil retention to be from the cylinder wall. And that's what's so critical with today's rings, thin rings, hard coated rings, and we're dealing with blocks that are significantly harder than they used to be. If you look at a, let's say a dart block or a dart and sleeve from eight or 10 years ago, very high quality stuff, best in the business. That block and that sleeve was about 200, 220 Brunel. We use Brunel on the hardness scale for cylinders. Today, they're in the high 200s, low 300s. I've seen cylinders that are in excess of 500 today. But yet at the end of the day, we still want the same finish. How do you get that finish? That's a completely, you know, another subject that will expand on how do you achieve that on that heart of a cylinder and why it's so important to be able to measure that cylinder finish. That's the true thing because we can throw all the oil up there you want. You can fire hose it. You can have oil jets, oil sprayers. You can have all those things going on, trying to get that lubrication up on the bore to keep that ring lubricated, keep that piston lubricated. But if it won't grab the bore and hang on and cling to the bore, well, guess what? The oil rings, the second rings, the compression rings are all trying to scrape that back down. Now add 20 inches of vacuum into the crankcase, and now we're trying to suck all that oil down back off the floor. Oh, and on top of it, let's throw some zero weight in it as well that has no ability to gray. It's, it's such a thin oil. It's going to suck it all right back to the pan. So this is part of why this has become so critical. And I'll toss it back at Lake with that said. Okay, great. Thanks, Keith. That was a uh, fantastic answer. So we have a couple of questions that have already kind of come in. So the first one I'm going to throw back at you, Ed. Uh, Arthur was asking, does crosshatch angle have any influence on the RPK, RVK, or the RK values? Uh, I have not seen crosshatch angle influence RPK or RVK values. I have seen it influence some of the RK values a little bit, but nothing major. Um, I would be looking at crosshatch angle, as you guys can better explain, simply from a ring rotation standpoint versus a, a surface finish standpoint, in my opinion. But, you know, Keith, I'd, I'd love to hear from you also on that, but. That's yeah. been my view. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ed. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen it make some minor changes there, but it's really crosshatch angle really kind of comes down to, uh, as Ed indicated, ring rotation speeds. You know, flatter angles turn the rings slower, steeper angles turn the rings more quickly. Uh, it also affects the ability to move oil up and down the bore. As the angles become more vertical or steeper, it's easier for that oil to migrate up and down the bore versus flatter angles it acts more like a dam or a bridge. So as the crosshatch angles flatten out, you absolutely stop the amount of blow by. We're flattening that angle out. We're creating more of a dam. We're creating more of a seal. So we're not getting as much blow by past there, but we're also not getting the oil migration up and down the bore. So crosshatch angles can become real critical. Generally, you'll see flatter angles in short stroke, high RPM stuff. Engines with longer cylinders, longer strokes, uh, Harley Davidson's, uh, you know, aircraft engines, locomotives, things like that are better, you know, generally low speed, but long cylinders. We'll get into more vertical angles that helps to promote oil and getting to the top of the bore. Uh, you also see in some of the flat engines, some of the boxers, uh, Porsches, Subaru, Subaru in particular, uh, they'll run a 60 degree angle that a little bit steeper angle, allowing you to get oil back to the sump a little easier. Flat engines are kind of synonymous as being oil burners. So that, that more vertical, Crosshatch angle helps them to get the oil back to the sump more easily. Uh, from a performance point of view, the flatter, more typical 45 degree crosshatch angle, I think is the way to go in most applications. There are times we'll go more vertical, a little flatter, but 45 generally isn't gonna do you wrong. And 45 means it's 45 degrees included angle, 
not 45 degrees from the deck. Correct, Keith? Correct. Uh, I was going to hit that, but I, I knew you'd jump on that one. Uh, that is correct. When we're talking about the angles, and I'll use my handy-dandy dry erase board here, and hopefully we'll try to keep this in the frame. Uh, that's not a good one. You better go. You better go a little darker. If we're looking at the deck, if we're talking a 45 degree angle, we're talking what is known as the included angle. That is the measurement between the up and the down cut. So if we drew an imaginary horizontal line through here, you're going to be 22 and a half degrees above or below, or you can simply come off the deck and measure off the deck. So if you're coming off again, the deck surface downwards, uh, 45, you're gonna be 22 and a half off the deck. Uh, that's easily measured with a protractor. Uh, we do have them here. We send them out all the time, no charge. Uh, looks like a little business card. The angles are dead correct. Or if you go to a place simply like a Hobby Lobby or a Michaels, uh, you can get little clear plastic protractors, nice and flexible, put them into the cylinder, check your cross hatch angles. Uh, the really nice way is with a USB microscope. Um, oh, Ed's got his right there. I, I think Lake's I, going I, for his. I don't, I, have I don't go anywhere without Wait, these. Ed. I carry these in my briefcase. <laughs> I give these to customers all the time. Excellent. They're a great little tool. I thought I had one here. Yeah, but yeah, I thought I had one. Sorry, I messed it all up. So I was looking for <laughs> one. Right. And I thought I had one, but I didn't. I keep Maybe my I handy. Didn't it last time. So anyway, uh, the other question is um, from our buddy Ron Knock at Diesel Motorsports. So a lot of what we talk about is related to gasoline engines or methanol fueled engines. So let's talk a little bit about these same principles: cross hatch angle. RVK, RPK, this ring seal soup, how does, what is, how does diesel applications factor into this? Ed, you got a comment on? No, I, I'd leave at? that more to Keith. I mean, honestly, I'm back to that same thing. Look, that's, you, you guys are the experts on what surface finish you need in different applications. I'm just the guy that can give it to you. So I, I'd really, uh, you know, uh, let Keith talk about okay. that. Keith? Well, I, I, again, I'll go back to my handy little board here. Yep. And what we're typically seeing, if we're, if we're looking at a cylinder finish, and I'll kind of do this kind of crudely, you're looking at wavelengths, heights and depths. This surface is the RPK for those unfamiliar with. This is the surface that the ring is actually going to see on a cold fire up. This area in here, what we're going to refer to as the bearing area, is known as the RK. And this is the blow peak. This is the RVK, the valley. So in the perfect world, we've got a very, very smooth top. So it's nice and easy on the ring. So it seats up well, doesn't scuff the ring up, doesn't tear it up. We've got good oil trapping just below this in the bearing area to support the ring, to keep that part, again, lubricated, to keep it off of all. We're not getting into, uh, we'll say metal to metal contact, which I know Lee can expand upon much better than myself. And then we've got the valley depth. This is your oil retention. So imagine standing this up vertically, this is the trough that holds the oil. If we don't have enough trough, we're not gonna hold any oil. Again, that oil is gonna get washed down into the pan. We're not gonna have any you know, retention for the rings. And what happens, as mentioned, alcohol motors, big boosted engines, diesels typically run a lot of fuel. We're, we're getting into copious amounts of fuel going through this engine. And that fuel is trying to take that oil with it. That fuel is turning that oil into a solvent, not a lubricant. It's breaking that oil down. We're getting that fuel into the pan. It's diluting the oil. It's losing its ability to retain and stick to the wall, lubricate the parts. Uh, 
I, I can go into many of these, especially, but on the diesels, it's in particularly a big deal because in the modern performance diesel, we're, we're achieving unbelievable power numbers. There's people out there in excess of 4,000 horsepower. One particular good customer of mine, I, I can't even begin to get into how much money this spent. I see Lake, Lake Shake, he knows all these different materials, all these different coatings, everything we did, it all came down to that, RVK. As we kept getting his RVK numbers up higher, higher and higher, his problems completely went away, went from 10 pounds of crankcase pressure to 0.68 pounds in a huge cubic inch, you know, six inch four diesel, making 4,500 horsepower. And it all came down to that oil retention. So answering Ron's question, yes, it becomes very, very critical, especially in a performance diesel, where we're really putting a lot of fuel through this engine because that fuel is trying to take that oil with it. All right. Yeah. Well said, Keith. And I think that that's kind of the general rule that is that the more fuel you run through the engine, the deeper that valley has to be in order to retain enough oil to offset it. Because if you don't have enough oil retention, like you said, the fuel destroys the oil. That's, you know, as a long-term tribologist oil guy, fuel is the enemy of your oil. There's no doubt about it. When you see high levels of fuel dilution, nothing good happens inside the engine when you have high levels of fuel dilution within the oil. So you, there think, you can almost think about that cylinder environment of you need to maintain the proper oil fuel ratio uh, up there. And that when you run more fuel, be it diesel with huge boost, giant injectors, or maybe even just mechanical injection methanol. Uh, whatever fuel you're running, the higher the level of fuel delivery, the deeper the valley has to be, be it gasoline or diesel. That's that kind of rule of thumb, which um, Ed basically means to have that deeper valley, what are you going to have to do in order from a honing perspective to achieve that valley? Sure. No, that's a great question. Like um, the, 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 a big deal again is, is and, and, you know, most people that have been around honing for many years, like, well, I won't date myself or you guys, but we've been around in this business for a while. Um, most customers, when, when you start talking about using 180 grit, uh, a diamond to put a base finish on, and you're actually honing to size, and then going in with a 600 grit CBN to, to give your plateau or your RPK value that you need, in order for your rings to, to uh, wear properly, they freak out when you start talking about these these really rough grits. You know, uh, in the past, a normal finish was a 220 grit, 280 grit. Maybe you hit it with a 400 grit for a little bit. Now we're talking about 180 grit finish to size and then going in for, and again, it'll depend on the RBK numbers you need. Uh, you know, it could be as little as six strokes or as many as 20 strokes. With the, with the 600 grit uh, CBNs. And that brings up a, a, just another point is, is a lot of people, when we start talking about these RPKs, RVKs, they think that, you know, if I continue to hone with my 600 grit, my finish is gonna get too fine for my rings. That 600 grit is going to put you right in that ballpark of RPK numbers that that you all are asking for. So you can use that for six strokes or you can use it for 20 strokes. It is not going to change your RPK value. What it will change is your RVK value. The more you hone with that, the less RVK you're gonna get. Yeah, because essentially, because the finishing stone, finishing grit, as you say, that the top side from that median line is what you're affecting up here. And that 600 grit, once you get it, that's going to be what that RPK value is because that is going to be determined by your, fi your finishing grit. It's how much stock removal determines how much valley you have left because the more stock you remove, the less valley you have. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. Perfect. All right. So we've got several questions. So unless somebody has a comment where we missed on something we need to clarify, let's go ahead and get to some of these questions because we got lots of them. Um, so the first one is, okay, what questions or criteria can an end user ask of a machine shop to evaluate their ability to perform the caliber of work 
that we're talking about here. Um, I bet all three of us I'd have the same answer. Quickly, <laughs> I was going to say that's an easy one. <laughs> pick up your pick up your this, profilometer. They need to have this. Do you have that's one right. of these? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, you, you need to have one of these. Yep. If you got one of these. You you can be good. That's right. <laughs> All right. Next question is, all right. Question one of my customers in the shops, what are rings made out of? And do they stand up to methanol built engines such as the six or engines like a 603 or 604 crate engine for dirt track racing? Basically, what are the tolerances and abuses different rings can stand up against? Um, Keith, I'll let you kind of handle that. Yeah, well, we're talking about the materials. Um, I'll basically hit, you're going to have basically two classes of material. We're, we're going to talk about the base material. That's what the actual rings made of, not the coating. Again, when we talked about Molly, we're talking about the coating. You know, chrome nitride, you're talking about the coating. You know, base material, you're going to have different grades of iron, meaning cast irons and into ductile irons or into hybrid ductile irons, uh, hardened ductile irons. And then you're going to have different classes of steel rings, meaning you've got carbon steel rings, uh, stainless steel rings, tool steel rings. Uh, so it's talking about the base material, methanol or gasoline, really, that's coming back to more bore finish uh, than the base material the ring is made out of. So the more severe the application is, we're talking about temperature, we're talking about heat. How much heat can that ring handle? The higher or better grade of material we're working with, the more heat the ring is going to be able to, to withstand. So if you've got a ring, one of the fun things to do is when you're building your engine, you've got your build book, you're writing down all your data, you're recording everything. You want to measure this dimension, the free gap. How much is that gap just sitting there after you file fit of the ring? That's an important dimension because let's just say for argument's sake, that number is 500,000. It's typical to see that ring close up maybe 80 a hundred thousands when it comes out of the engine due to normal heat cycling. But if I take that ring out of that engine and it's closed down, it's down to 150, 200 thousands or completely collapsed, it's overlapped. I know I've annealed or crept that metal. I've gotten that metal too hot. So that's telling me either I don't have a good enough base material. Let's say I stuck a plain cast iron ring into a three-stage nitrous engine. That ring's never going to handle that amount of heat. The, 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 you know, the amount of oxygen content in there is so high, it's simply going to collapse the ring from heat or possibly break it. Cast iron is fairly brittle. It will actually snap. I don't have, uh, uh, actually, I think I do, a really tiny one. Now you're getting a real up close shot of my mug. Sorry, digging through my box. Here it is. That's a half inch little compressor ring that we make. And that's made out of just plain, SG cast iron. There you go. They break really easy. So uh, another wounded warrior. Uh, so that's kind of the thing. You get it, then you'll, a cast iron ring into that severe environment, you can literally just break the ring or fatigue the ring and collapse the ring. Now, as we start moving up the chain, we move into the ductile irons, the hardened ductile irons. And the question is always, how do I know which one I need? Well, let the engine talk to you. Look at the rings coming out of the engine. If your free gaps are good, it's not annealing. It's not taking the tension out of the ring. That ring you're running is adequate for your application. That's not an issue. Now, we can look at different base coatings, different honing processes, things to optimize that. But as far as the base material, that ring's great. Now, if it comes out and it's all collapsed, and one, we got to look at tune-up. You know, if we've got a tune-up that's out the window, well, yeah, that can knock a ring out pretty quick. But if you're not knocking head gaskets out of the ring, you know, the thing, the plugs look good. You're not lifting ring lands. Everything looks nice. And you're knocking that ring out of there. Well, we've got to go up the ladder. We've got to move up the chain. We've got to get away from ductiles. We've got to move into steels, whether that be carbon or possibly stainless or into an M2 tool. We have to look, we have to keep ratcheting up to find a ring that's going to handle the heat that you're creating in that engine. So that's kind of the difference in the materials and how you look at the materials, look at the ring, Listen to the ring when it comes out of the engine. It'll tell you if it's holding up or not. Hopefully that answers that question. No, I think that was a perfect answer. So it's really not so much about what the fuel, the fuel issue is more about hone, how, how much surface, uh, how much value you have to hold the oil is really about the ring materials, about the amount of heat 
the cylinder pressure, combustion temperature you're generating. That higher compression, higher horsepower engine is going to generate more heat, and you need to have a ring material capable of handling that heat. And I was over at you know, Pat and Ucy's last week, and he, of course, he uses our M2 tool steel uh, rings. And the reason why is because they're running, you know, an ungodly amount of nitrous <laughs> in those engines, generating just incredible amount of heat. And that's the material that can handle uh, that, that, that environment. So, uh, yeah, great answer on that. So next question was, does the oil used for cam break in, break in impact ring break in? I'll take that question. Uh, yes. I think, uh, you got a guy that this. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might have an answer for that one. Yes, it does. So there are, you know, breaking oil is a great thing just in general terms, especially for rebuilt engines, performance engines, you know, breaking oil is a good thing. Now, that being said, there are some breaking oils that are formulated specifically for flat tappet cams and they are brilliant for camshafts and they are the devil for ring seal because what's going on is this piston ring while it's moving up and down during initial break-in is taking some of those peaks off there's still some honing if you will some metal working going on during the ring break-in process and if that oil will not allow that to happen you're going to have higher blow by the rings aren't going to bed in properly so it's really a balancing act between keeping the cam happy and then the rings happy as well. So really, uh, you know, Keith and I did a video on this. It's on our YouTube channel, uh, uh, Total Seal. If you go to YouTube and go to Total Seal Piston Rings, there's a video where we really give you a long-term answer on that. And there's information uh, at the Speed Diagnostics website that list all the different breaking oils and the chemical content of them. So you can see, because we're not going to tell you, oh, use this brand or use that brand. We're not trying to pick brands and, and do that and get into that fight. Essentially, what you're looking for is a low detergent break-in oil. So you need a high level of zinc, which is good for your cams and good for the rings, but you want a low level of detergent so the rings can break in. That's really the key thing is that low detergent, high zinc, then you're going to be just fine. Um, next question is from our buddy, Josh Tennis. Hey, Josh. Uh, are you advocating a different finish for a stock block versus a heavy duty aftermarket, like a CGI block with the same application and same ring package? Uh, I'm thinking Josh is talking here, uh, Ed and Keith, about a diesel application and I think what we're, I'm going to talk for you here a little bit, Ed. Sure. I don't think it's necessarily, we're talking about a different finish, right. but because of the different materials, we're talking about different abrasives that would be required to reach the same finish. Yeah. Excellent point, Lake. Absolutely spot on. You're, you're right. Depending, and Keith alluded to that earlier, is, is about the Brunel of the block. So, uh, uh, so an OEM block probably has a, a, a lower Brunel than an aftermarket block does. Now, the nice thing about the 180 grit diamonds that we use is, is it tends to put a large enough valley or RVK number in there that it gives you some latitude. So, you know, if you get a, a soft block or a softer block, you can still use those 180s you may just end up with 20 strokes on the CBN 600 grits versus say uh, 10 strokes with an aftermarket higher Brunel block because we're not gonna get the penetration factor in on the diamonds in a higher Brunel block that we do on the softer block, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes total sense, yeah. So it, re it really isn't about not, we're trying, not advocating a different finish for no. the application, but a different abrasive process and stock removal process in order to achieve the same finish just on the different block materials. And that works for diesel and gasoline engines as well. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so another question here is from Mike. What are some maximum and minimum parameters for RPK, RVK, and RK and Keith, you, you want to kind of, I know there's not a 
there's not a simple answer to that question, uh, but maybe given some over, maybe some general parameters, maybe is a bit better way of answering that question. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is very application specific. Uh, interesting, the RPK number, that, that, that peak roughness, the area that the ring's gonna actually come into contact with on startup, we're going to look for that number. Again, we're talking micro inches here, not millimeters. Uh, so in, in micro inches, we're generally looking for something in the 10 to 20 range. 10 to 15 is kind of the sweet spot. There are applications where we'll go a little lower. There are some where we'll go slightly higher. But that number seems to be pretty consistent. Doesn't damage the ring. Doesn't scuff the ring. Let's it do the final honing process. As Lake said, uh, the ring is the final machining step. So that's kind of the sweet spot. But the next two numbers, the RK and the RVK, those are the numbers that are really application specific. Uh, if I'm dealing with a zero weight oil NHRA Pro stock engine uh, that I know only has to go 50 passes before it's gonna get rebuilt again, I can run some relatively low numbers. And also knowing I'm dealing with a block that's 300, 330 uh, Brunel. It doesn't wear very fast. It's pretty hard. I can run some relatively light, low numbers here to keep the amount of oil on the board to the minimum. You know, keep the part, you know, that just on that fine edge of what it takes to keep that part lubricated. Now, go in the other direction. I'm in a stock block with a big diesel with, you know, 150 pounds of boost and fuel running out the tailpipe. It's so fat. These numbers are going to have to go up because I'm going to wear that block faster because it's a stock production block. It's softer. I'm asking a lot more of it. So these numbers have to go up. The one thing you try to shoot for is let's just say we talk the RBK number. We want 75. I'm just throwing that out as a theoretical. I generally want to see the RK number about 10 points below the RVK. This is not a deal killer if it's the same or slightly higher. Again, that running in process of the ring is going to correct these numbers. The whole point of plateauing is we're doing what the rings do naturally. You can have these numbers all jacked up. And if you're willing to wait long enough and you've got rings that have enough tension, enough friction, an oil that's bad enough, it is going to correct these numbers over time. It's going to happen. But you know, in today's world, we want it right now. We want to fire that engine up. 30 seconds later, it's as good as it's ever going to be. And that's all about getting these numbers right. If we get these numbers right, it's in. One hit, two hits on the dyno, three maybe on a bad day. It's in. It's done. If we miss these numbers, I get people all the time, you know, hey, it took me, you know, 7,000 miles to get my rings to come in. They took forever. Somebody missed the bore finish by a mile. That's what's happened. It's taken that long for the ring to wear that finish in. So it's really a matter of getting what I'll call the right ratio to the numbers. If the RK is off a little bit, the ring will correct that through the run-in process, but we want to kind of hit the general parameters. And that's something you can always reach out to us, email us, call us, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. And we can kind of point you to the right, you know, Hey, this is where we really think you ought to be. And yes, one of the questions about how high the numbers go, uh, talking about the diesel I spoke about before, when we first started working on that engine, uh, we were shooting for our VK numbers in the 80, 90 range, which we all agreed at the time we thought was a pretty big number. But as we found out, that engine ended up with our VKs a little over 150, which is what it took in that application. As Lake puts it, you know, right amount of oil, right place, right time in that engine with that fuel, with what he's doing, that's what it took to get it right. So I'll never say there's a wrong number. It's what's the right number for what you're doing. Perfect. Great answer. A um, couple of questions here. Uh, Matt, Sarah, hey, good to see you, Matt. Uh, has a question, uh, suggestions for a profilometer. He says he sees them from $300 to $7,000. Is there an industry norm? I would recommend this one right here, which is the Mitutoyo SJ2010. And um, shameless plug here, you can call... Total Seal, and we will sell them to you. And Mr. Jones, right there on your screen, personally sets them up, calibrates it for you, and sends you a box where you can open it up and take it out and run it. And it's, you know, $2,200, $2,300, something like that for them right now. So that's what I would recommend is go that route. Yeah, let me chime uh, in here just a little bit, being a uh, just a, the guy that does sure. the cylinder finishes. 
I completely agree with Lake and Keith there. The SJ, two, I call it a 210, maybe it's a 2010 now, the new model. They work wonderfully. Uh, they give you all the parameters that you need and then some. And it is really nice, especially going through Total Seal, that they set it up for you because surface finish analyzers have different settings in them. And there is an industry standard that you should use. If you're off that industry standard, you could be getting some finishes that really aren't necessarily proper for your application. So I highly recommend using uh, the Mitatoya SJ210 or 2010. And I highly recommend buying them from Total Seal Piston Rings because in all honesty, if you get on the website, they're as inexpensive as anybody at selling those profilometers. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in real quick if you don't mind. Uh, and, and it is an SJ210. And one of the things that's neat about this, there's a lot of profilometers out there, like Matt said. I mean, you know, we have profilometers here that we use in our shop. Hey, these, they're six figures. I mean, you can spend yep. unbelievable amounts of money. And that's on, you know, an actual 2D profilometer. You get into 3D profilometers that are measuring these things optically. Oh, sky's the limit. I mean, you, you, you could literally invest millions, but what they can show you and what they can do is unbelievable. But bang for the buck. This is a hard machine to beat. It does a tremendous amount of stuff. It's computer compatible. It can download to micro SD memory cards. It's got a USB port. You can, you know, uh, Minitoyo has free communication software for it. You can take this data, save it, put it into a customer file, print it out, do a, a million different things with it. But bang for the buck, it's a really, really tough machine to beat. Is there better? Are there other ones that out there that do things like that'll do this? Do absolutely. But for us, this has been a good machine, very reliable, very cost effective. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of put in a plug for, for Mark Malberg. Uh, Digital Metrology, uh, you need to check out their website. I wish I had it up here, I apologize. Uh, the software these guys offer for all kinds of profilometers in the 2D and the 3D world is absolutely mind blowing. If you go on their site, check it out. They've got great videos on understanding all these numbers looking at three-dimensional breakdowns of, of cylinder surfaces. Uh, absolutely incredible stuff. You need to check it out, digital metrology. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, Mark software is fantastic. Great additional tool to have. And if you're serious about getting a profilometer and checking, I know Ed's big on this, um, and I'm taking the, taking the thunder from him on this, is that while you're in your process of you know, different block materials, like we said, different hardness. It's going to be a different process to achieve that finish. And what you want to do is you want to check your finish during that process. So between your going to size with your roughing uh, abrasive and then your finishing abrasive, you want to check. Well, our buddy Brad Lagman at QMP makes this awesome little tool that can hold the stylus. You so you can hold it in the bore. And you can check it at different locations. You can even check blocks that have already been run, uh, so you can know what where you are in terms of the life of that bore and everything. So this is a pretty cool little, little tool to, to have as well. Just want to throw that in there as we're throwing you all the tools. So yeah, if you really want to go all out, get you your Mitotoyo profilometer, get your your holder, and get your your software for Mark, and then you're in business like Brad is <laughs> with all the cool <laughs> yeah. stuff. And I'll add to that, Lake, I don't go, when I'm out setting up equipment, I don't go anywhere without my profilometer. You know, I happen to carry an SJ310, which gives me an immediate printout. And that's only for the customers because you guys alluded a little earlier about that, or, or I think it was Keith, you know, you, you, you looked at this finish and it was brilliant. It was perfect. It looked great. But then when you did a test, it, it was the wrong RVK numbers. So, so I, every time I go out and especially when I'm converting customers from standard abrasives to diamonds, that you can't compare a 220 grit diamond with a 220 grit standard abrasive, it's a completely different finish. And so I yeah. always take my surface analyzer with me. Always, always, always. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just touch on that real quick. Is, you know, the thing that I run into the, you know, so much and, and Ed, I know Ed knows this, and I know Lake knows this, because Lake's been out and checked a lot of guys' stuff. When you're looking, you know, you've got the profilometer, looking at blocks that come back in, measure that run surface. Measure the part in the bottom where it hasn't been run. Know where it started, 
know where it ended up. This is a great tool to see how this engine's done. If it's sealed up great, it's running great, everything's fantastic about it. Look at that run surface, take those numbers, add 10 points across the board. That's about where you want to be. It's, it's again, you know, we're, we're listening to that engine. It's telling you, this is where I want the finish. This is where I'm happy, but I can't start here. I've got to start up here. So again, that break-in process, I have to wear it back down. So if I give it that room to wear into where it's happy, it's going to come in right now. It, you know, be the engine whisperer, listen to what it's saying. Look at the finishes, you know, pre and post. It says a lot about the engine. Then from the honing point of view, the thing that I run into almost daily is we, we've all been taught by our parents, parents, our grandfathers, our mothers, this is how we do things. And, and things have changed tremendously. The blocks are much harder. The oils are completely different. The rings, the ring tensions, completely different than what they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. The honings had to change with it. But the one thing that I find all the time is people are afraid to lay that valley in there to get that depth. They want to come in with a 220, then hit it with a 280, rub it some with a 320, 400. Then I'm going to polish it, going to put my thousand grit in there, wrap the hone head with that a couple times. And they they just go way too many steps. I'm telling you, folks, outside of roughing, two, three steps. That's it. Generally, you can nail it in two steps, a sizing and a finishing. As Ed said, this number represents the roughing stone or the finishing. You're bringing it to size. This number recommends represents the plateauing stone, the 600 CPN. These are your numbers. Don't be afraid to lay some base in there. Get after this thing. Because if you don't lay this bottom in there, you can't have it when you're done. You're going to wipe it out. If you've got this little shallow cut, I come in and do all my plateau work. Guess what? My RVK is gone. Don't be afraid to go in there and, and we'll say lay the wood to it. Uh, you can always plateau it down. That's it. But if you don't have it there to begin with, it won't be there when you're done. And that's probably the single biggest thing I see messed up. Yeah, as uh, let me add to that. As Lake said point. just a little bit earlier, he kind of alluded to it. If you're looking for, and Keith, I think, used the number 65 RVK. So if you're looking for a 65 RVK when you're finished, you can't start with a 40 or a 50 or a 60 RVK. When you put those 600 grit CBNs in there, your RVK is going to go down. So you've got to start with a 90 or 100, 110 RVK. I'll start with a much higher RVK number, I can always bring it down, but I can't add to it once I get into the finish process. So really, really, really use those profilometers to check your, you know, most people just want to use it for the finish process. No, 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 no. Use it for your base finish. That's, that's the critical point right there. No, great point, Ed. And I think one thing we want to talk about, we mentioned uh, in our personal conversations before is that when you look at these, uh, information on here when that profilometer is going to give you that scale it's going to show you that trace of the surface finish like kind of like Keith drew in the board there that scale is plus minus 200 micro inches and the key thing to understand is a tenth of a thousandth is equal to 100 micro inches so that's one thing to keep, really people need to under, understand that if you go in there and you go only um, within a thousandth of size with your roughing stone and then take a thousandth out with your finishing stone, everything that your roughing stone gave you for valleys is gone. That's why you, it, you have to go to size with your roughing stone and then only take out a tenth or two in order to get your plateau because two tenths is 200 micro inches, which is the full scale, you know, plus minus on the thing. So this is, those are the things to keep in mind. I want to point out, uh, we got a couple of last questions to get to. Um, Nate uh, Baylor's asking the question, this is going to be for you, Ed. What steps do you recommend for the final cleaning before assembly after diamond honing to ensure all the honing debris is out of the cylinder walls? Well, that's a great question, Nate. Uh, the, the, the analogy that I use is, is, first of all, diamond is an extremely hard particle. And the bonding agent that holds that diamond is much more uh, robust than, a, than, say, the old standard abrasives that, that you know, were, were used like a, a glue. And so, 
you're not going to get the abrasive uh, penetrating or, or left in the bores with a diamond abrasive like you will a standard abrasive. I guess the best analogy I can give you is, is a typical standard abrasive uh, set will give you approximately 60 to 80 bores in the life of a, a standard abrasive. A diamond abrasive will give you 80,000 to 90,000 bores per its lifetime. And they're roughly about the same height. So, so tremendous difference there. My personal opinion is, is I, I do a few motors on the side. I, I help on a blown alcohol car. So, so we do a, 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 some of this stuff on our own, but I'm an ultrasonic guy, man. I, I, I love to put the blocks in an ultrasonic cleaner before assembly and, and make sure not only the cylinder bores are clean, but the rest of the motor. I get so many guys that, you know, they clean the cylinders to the umpteenth degree, but <laughs> You know, you can take a rag or something and you wipe in the oil galley or, or down in the, the crank crankcase area and, and you still come out with dirt. And it's like, guys, that all that stuff is still cycling through the motor. So I'm an ultrasonic guy. And then, uh, you know, I'll probably get in trouble for this. But in the end, I, I always clean my cylinders with transmission fluid. And then I put a, a uh, clean them completely. And then I put a, a break in oil like total seal cells you know, in the cylinder walls once I know that they're clean. Well, thank you. I, I really hate to interrupt, but we're getting uh, you know, close to uh, 8, 955 here in California. So uh, again, we could have you know, listened to you guys for probably another three hours. Uh, fascinating uh, knowledge, technology, uh, expertise, and uh, you know, we're delighted to, to have you part of this. A big thank you uh, to everyone at uh, Total Seal. Uh, they have been, you know, supporter of the ePortrait platform since uh, uh, since we launched. And thank you very much. We're going to have Lake back again later this week uh, on Thursday at 2 Pacific to talk about oil analysis. Registering on ePortrait is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now, and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.